God loves you. He has things for you. He designed you in his image. People don't don't sometimes really, they, they're words that you say, but they don't really realize that. Uh, in, in God's image is imagination, the expanse of his imagination is my imagination too, and I have a right to use that imagination. So people always say, well, that was my idea. No, ideas are just circulating in the universe. I think when you when you get in touch with the deeper levels of life in yourself, that you tune into a vibration that's present throughout the universe. It's a spiritual way of thinking. We are part of a movement called New Thought, which, by the way, no one has heard of. We're labeling things all the time, and it's funny that we even call this thing New Thought because it's been around forever. It's actually it's a, it's a process of remembering what we already know. It's all about our thoughts creating our lives and our being one with God. And there's nothing really new about it. It's just a new presentation of an ancient concept. It's uh, known by, by other names or no name at all in many countries by many people. New thought is not just about sitting and thinking. New thought is about mind power, it's about heart power, it's about spirituality. It's actually about being one with the divine and raising your thoughts from a human egocentric consciousness, one to a divine consciousness. And in that expanded awareness is a new intuition, a new insight, a new imagination, new contexts, new meanings, new stories. Our belief is to give, to, to encourage, and to encourage a person to be the best person he or she can be, to be a person of love and harmony and peace and support and belief in the goodness of humanity. There's a whole philosophy, there's a whole point of view. There are saints and sages and mystics and prophets and living masters and Oprah's and Michael Bethwick's and, and amazing souls on the planet carrying this light, carrying this forward. People may not even be recognizing that they're, that they're watching something about new thought. New thought may permeate almost everything because it is a chameleon and it's really uh, compatible with almost anything and everything. New Thought is, uh, you know, this wonderful and rich uh, tradition that extends really to the first century of Christianity and, uh, you know, even further back than that. Uh, but it has its uh, conglomeration of energies that occurred really within the 20th century of American history when the Transcendentalist movement kind of merged with the, uh, what, I, what I call and define as the Mind Cure movement along with progressive Christianity. Uh, and those three circles together mixed in a unique way in early American history in the 1800s that gave birth to this thing that we call the New Thought Movement now, which includes unity and religious science and centers for spiritual living uh, and many other groups. Uh, but behind all of even that is this backdrop of universal spiritual principles, universal truths and ancient wisdom uh, that we find in Hermes and Plato and uh, the Greek mythologies and uh, Taoism, Lao Tzu and the Buddha. Uh, so it's really a, a conglomeration of uh, the great wisdom of the ages. It was in the 19th century that there began to be a revolution of consciousness. People became more conscious of the subconscious mind, of the power of their thoughts upon themselves and their environment and the world. Uh, what you see in the late 1800s uh, was the writing of these ideas began to be formed by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and these people who gathered at Walden Pond. Uh, they began to write about these ideas of the mystical self, the transcendental self, the awakening self, as being not just for the mystics, but for everybody. And that there was a way to get direct contact to that. Uh, 
So that writing really began with the Transcendentalists in the late 1800s. Let's look at what was happening in Maine. There was Phineas Parkhurst Quimby, and he had been studying Anton Mesmer who was traveling and, and, and lecturing in Europe. And it was then called mesmerism after him. The word hypnotism hadn't yet come about. He really sort of discovered that if people thought they would be better, then they would be better. You know, he started, he used to use, it's so interesting. He, he started his ministry using magnets. He, and and then he realized one day when he was going to do this healing demonstration, he forgot his magnet. And so he did the demonstration and it still worked. And so that's when he realized it's not the magnets, it's the mind. And Phineas Quimby came along and saw what Mesmer was doing and decided this use of hypnosis and mesmerizing to get to the subjective consciousness, to, the, to, the, to the, uh, a level of consciousness that is underneath our conscious thought, is a way to heal. And so Phineas Quinby created a healing uh, science about all of this. Now, Phineas Quimby is uh, given the honor of being the man who brought new thought to uh, America. And he was originally a clock maker. He, he began uh, to question, because of his own health, Phineas Quimby's, whether Jesus meant that you could actually do this for oneself. So he, while literally walking his horse and buggy, decided that he could heal himself. He invoked these very principles, healed himself, and then he began healing people. And that's why he became known as Dr. Quimby, not because he ever uh, required a medical license, but because he kept healing people. People who, who by the way, medical license people could not heal. And Phineas Quimby took these principles and was able to actually uh, create physical healing, uh, overcame tuberculosis at a time when that was a death sentence. Well, Phineas P. Quimby was a, a very curious, as most new thought people are, a very curious man who studied many things in order to find truth. He was on a search for truth. He learned from a, a man who was essentially a trance medium how to do hypnotic suggestion in terms of uh, affecting a mental cure. And he took it to a, a more deeply spiritual level. He was able to access the subconscious mind and find the power not only of bringing forth what was in somebody's subconscious mind, but being able to positively affect them for their health and well-being. And he practiced it based on that mesmerism until he began to find out that the foundation of it was not in hypnotism, but it was in people being able to be transformed in the way in which they thought. And if they changed the way that they thought, they could change the circumstances and conditions of their life. He wanted people to understand that their mind was creating their reality. And he had a famous phrase that said, the explanation is the cure. So he wanted people to come to hear his explanation so they could be healed. But how, did, how do you get people into the room? He wrote up a flyer, a broadsheet, an advertisement. He had it printed. He would distribute it. And very often it had one of the most powerful words in marketing right on it, free talk. Free is powerful. So people would come to the talk there, he would give his presentation, he would give his demonstration, and very often he used hypnosis, he used mind power, he used the new thought philosophy that he was creating and developing in order to help people. He never began a movement of any kind, but by the way, one of his most famous patients, as you probably know, was a, a lady by the name of Mary Baker Eddy. And she had a wonderful healing, and she began a spiritual movement, as you know, called Christian Science. Well, Mary Baker Eddy, you know, she went, she heard of what Phineas Parker Squimby was doing in his healing methods. She went to him for healing. She was healed uh, through his uh, methods of what today we would refer to as affirmative prayer, spiritual mind treatment, and uh, these sorts of uh, affirmative consciousness methods. She began to uh, go to scripture herself and to study these ideas, correspond them with the healing and teachings of Jesus. 
uh, began to write and began to teach other people these same methods. She became very popular uh, and a great teacher of, of many and created her own movement, what today is the Christian Science uh, Movement. Mary was very convinced uh, that these ideas were her ideas, that she had received kind of a divine revelation from spirit, uh, that she was the articulator of these, this movement uh, called Christian Science. And she denied, in fact, for a while that she even knew Quimby or that was ever even healed by him. Of course, this is obviously way before the days of emails and Google and all of these other things. And so, uh, so people believed her. If people believed when she said, this is my divine idea. They took her at her, at her word. And there was a big controversy uh, after Quimby's death. They actually found letters, letters that she wrote to Quimby thanking him uh, for uh, his healing work. So she eventually did admit that she knew Quimby, she knew of his work, but that hers was different and special. What, what happened within the Christian Science Church was an unusual piece of religious dogma. And that is that Mary Baker Eddy decided that these ideas were hers uh, and not universal ideas. Whereas uh, where the other mystics, the transcendentalists and the like, who had been coming, coming, uh, ma being made aware through their own evolution of these ideas, uh, they, most of us have discovered, of course, that they belong to everybody. Christian science came before any of the others. And Mary Baker Eddy has been highly criticized because she was very controlling, but she was a woman going into a man's world teaching something new. But she was the one who took it out and created an organization. And if you ever read her life story, she went through some very, very hard times in doing it. Among her star students was a woman uh, named Emma Curtis Hopkins, who became the first editor of the Christian Science uh, magazine. And Emma had some of her own ideas, also being a very brilliant woman of the 20th century. And it, instead of just publishing what Mary told her to publish, Emma began to uh, articulate some of her own ideas and put some of those ideas in the newsletters. And that became very controversial for Mary. So Emma was excommunicated um, uh, by Mary Baker Eddy, as well as many other individuals were. Several of her teachers left Christian Science uh, and became independent teachers. So there was that influence in the early New Thought movement uh, that had come from Christian Science. And then the teachers who left became independent thinkers and teachers in their own right. Emma Curtis Hopkins and Mary Baker Eddy went their separate ways. Emma Curtis Hopkins has now taken Mary Baker Eddy's ideas with Quimby's ideas that came, actually can trace all their lineage back to Plato and before, all of those ideas, and she began to teach ways that people could change their lives, ways people could heal their lives. Emma was infamous for saying that all is life, all is life. There was such a pure, direct, absolutist ideal about Emma in terms of the power of mind. And so that kind of influence went off in its direction and spawned a whole nother uh, amazing, amazing offshoot of new thought. And they included Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, um, who founded Unity. Uh, Melinda Kramer, uh, Nona Brooks, and others um, who founded Divine Science, and eventually Ernest Holmes who founded Religious Science. Um, she also had um, various writers, um, New Thought writers, um, including H. Emily Cady who wrote Lessons in Truth for Unity. Um, Ella Wheeler Wilcox, who was a writer, and a number of other folks. Other groups were spe spreading throughout the country, doing their own teaching and healing. And all of them began uh, to attract around this new label called New Thought. And that began to attract an audience who obviously modern medicine wasn't very modern at that time. So alternative healing methods were, were very popular. Those began to cross boundaries and blend with various forms of Christianity and then people who were in, interested in alternative spirituality as well. So all of that began to be the soup and the mix that uh, gave birth to this new thing and the first New Thought uh, movements and what we today would call denominations 
uh, began to appear in the early uh, 1900s. The divine science movement really has two streams of thought. Melinda Kramer begins uh, teaching um, these ideas very early on in San Francisco, which was her home. Melinda Kramer had been an invalid and had been under medical treatment for 23 out of 25 years by being an invalid. Uh, she got tired of this and she refuses more treatment and of course her friends are all upset and she says is there any power in this great universe that can heal me well <laughs> magic words or something there because she has this revelation and she understands things that she's been taught about god she realizes omnipresence it was a tremendous revelation and she was totally healed and her friends couldn't believe it you can walk upstairs by yourself you can sit up all morning. So they didn't believe it at first, but people understood, they saw that she was healed and people started coming to her for healing. So she did healing. This was in 1885 about her, when she had her revelation. So by two years later, 1887, she started teaching because people wanted the teachings and uh, she called her teaching divine science. Switched to Pueblo, Colorado. In 1887, Nona Brooks and her two sisters were living there in Pueblo. And there was a lady who was very ill and she went to Chicago for treatment. One lady says, go to Emma Curtis Hopkins. So she goes there, sits in her, her classes and is healed. She goes back to Pueblo, all excited about this new teaching. She starts having classes on the fourth class. Nona has this similar type of revelation like Melinda Kramer had. And she is healed financially, physically, emotionally. She is really healed. So then they start teaching. So this, there's two years from between Melinda Kramer's and Nona Brooks, and they, of course, didn't know each other. When Melinda Kramer is coming, it is, is traveling teaching, she goes to Denver. The Brooks sisters go to listen to her, and they find out it's exactly what they're teaching. And they're thrilled, and so they ask if they can call theirs to find science. And Melinda Kramer says, of course. So you have divine science in two places. And the movement really has those two streams um, so that the movement really continues with Nona Brooks. Emmett Fox, of course, was one of the more uh, uh, successful in draw as far as drawing numbers of people, uh, New Thought teachers. He started in New York City and uh, uh, at one time, he was in the Hippodrome, one of the largest auditoriums in New York that seats over 5,000 people. And when that was torn down to make room for some reconstruction in that area of New York, he moved to Carnegie Hall and uh, filled that every Sunday for years. Uh, but he, uh, he was very open uh, and very universal in his approach. And, uh, and of course, his books still sell in, selling in, in good quantities even today. So we had first Christian Science, Divine Science, Unity, of course, the Fillmores. Merle Fillmore was very ill and heard something from a student of Emma Curtis Hopkins that changed her life. It healed her of what was known at the time as tuberculosis. She and her husband, Charles Fillmore, became students of Emma Curtis Hopkins, along with the founders of Divine Science, along with founders of other New Thought churches, the Home Church for Truth is one of them. Charles Fillmore was heard to say many times he did not think the world needed one more religious denomination, um, but out of necessity they got in through the back door. Uh, I think it's indicative of the openness of unity that when Charles Fillmore was approached in the 19th century by many people who said, you need to have a course study, some kind of lessons, because you know, you've got a teaching here, what is it? 
he contacted a woman who had sent him an unsolicited manuscript named Emily Cady, who was a physician in New York City. And he never once met her. She never once set foot in a Unity Church. And that is Unity's basic textbook. Charles Zimmerdel um, really, in terms of Unity, thought of Unity as a school, as a place where people would be instructed, receive um, spiritual uh, guidance, and would then take the message back to their own churches. Um, so particularly in those early years, and I think it's true in other movements as well, uh, they were meeting together in classes, um, but uh, really avoiding that time of Sunday morning uh, when other churches were in session. Over time, a group gathers that really uh, want to have services together, um, and Charles and Myrtle begin holding services on Sunday mornings. Uh, Unity adopts radio very early in the 20s. Um, in the 20s, they have their own radio station, WOQ, here in Kansas City, Missouri. It was Myrtle Fillmore who, you know, became quickened with the truth. And, and Charles was with her along there, but she's the one that still that carried forward with it. She started having prayer groups and people started hearing about the results of prayer and her teaching. Well, see, Charles Fillmore was a successful businessman and said, you know, let's start printing stuff. So he was the one that brought that aspect into it. And that's just how it kind of started. Johnny Coleman began taking classes here in 1953. Um, her mother had had a connection with Unity, and when Johnny Coleman was um, having a physical challenge, a health challenge, um, her mother encouraged her to contact Unity, to read the publications, um, and she began to do that and eventually came here uh, to take classes. Um, eventually, Johnny Coleman starts her own, own organization and um, developed a whole number of churches and programs related to that as well. She was first introduced to Unity through the periodicals that her mother received and she read. And then she was encouraged by her mother to go to Unity Village and to see whether it worked for herself. Uh, they told her that she didn't have to die if she didn't want to. And of course, she was a young woman and did not want to experience that part of her life. And so she began to study and she became in love with the principles that she was learning and their effectiveness on her life. She many times would explain it that she don't know when it happened and how it happened. All that happened was one day she did not have the disease and that was in the middle of the 20th century. She was a part of the Unity Movement for 18 years. And she served in various positions within Unity, including beginning a church in Chicago. The first church she began was um, Christ Unity Temple uh, in Chicago. And it was not until 1974 that she uh, founded the Universal Foundation for Better Living. And so all of this was happening in the 1860s and on up. And so who were the latest kids on the block? We were in the early 1900s. And so Ernest Holmes had studied all of this. He studied Christian science. He studied, of course, was raised with the Christian Bible. Then he began studying Emerson and Troward and uh, the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and, and Eastern philosophies. He read poetry and he discovered Ralph Waldo Emerson and he discovered Judge Thomas Troward. Two men, one here in the United States, and Judge Thomas Troward, who spent a lot of his life living in India and was originally a British citizen. And both of them wrote about their observations of nature and how there was an order to life, an order to nature, and that we human beings are in that same life flow. And so Ernest Holmes began to read more and talk 
he began to have little gatherings and groups of people to get together and talk about this idea of a divine universal flow that all of us, that all things, that all nature is a part of. And so out of that came his ideas for this philosophy that we call religious science. And uh, Ernest Holmes uh, established what he called the Science of Mind Institute in Los Angeles, teaching classes. Of course, he lectured widely in uh, Southern California. And it was only in the 30s when some of his graduates uh, came to him and said, uh, we'd like to have a place to go with our families on Sunday morning and take our children and because uh, we're not satisfied with Orthodox Church anymore after we've been through Science of Mind classes. And can we start, start a church? And he said, well, if you do it if you want to, but I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that idea. But he, he let them do it. And of course, it grew into the Churches of Religious Science, of which there are hundreds now. But uh, Ernest himself was not interested in uh, a formal organized uh, structure. Uh, in fact, uh, for many years, he lectured every Sunday in a rented theater in Beverly Hills. And when Bill Hornaday, uh, who later became his successor and the, the main minister at this religious science church in Los Angeles, uh, got the idea of building a permanent church building uh, on 6th Street in Los Angeles, Ernest said, all right, if you want to, raise the money and do it if you want to. And uh, when he spoke at the dedication, he said, this church was Bill's idea, not mine. So <laughs> he, he saw himself as an educator and not as a, not as a uh, religious, religious figure. One of Emma Curtis Hopkins' last students was Ernest Holmes, who found a religious science, who influenced each in a way in Japan. So it's now more global, those ideas that were first written by Phineas Quimby and are articulated in whatever version, whatever cultural interpretation that each of these teachers came out. Uh, now there's interesting, there was also things happening in Europe. Uh, unfoldment of these ideas were happening in Italy and they were happening uh, with, uh, uh, in the East and coming from the East uh, with self realization Fellowship and Yogananda, Parahamsa Yogananda and and the yogis that began to come here. This knowledge of East and West that's coming together began to happen, as I say, in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who is admired by New Thought people, and uh, Henry David Thoreau, they read the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads, which had at that time been just recently published in English for the first time. Paramahansa Yogananda, my teacher, uh, lectured at the uh, New Thought Congress in New York City in 1926. Uh, one of the early speakers at New, New Thought gatherings in the uh, early, early part of the last century, uh, William Walker Atkinson, wrote a series of books on yoga philosophy under a pen name, uh, Yogi Ramacharakra. So the influence has been there for years. So the, the lineage of this progressive Christian uh, idea, what I call progressive Christianity, uh, ex extends back to the first century of Christianity. There were five, at least five theological schools within the first uh, century uh, of Christian history, and three of them were liberal and metaphorical teachings. They, they, we're talking within the first hundred years of Christianity, there were three theological schools that did not teach literal interpretation of the Bible. They did not teach literal interpretation of scripture. They taught metaphorical, allegorical interpretations. And so that trend uh, over the centuries has constantly been sought to be squashed by, by the literalist, but it has never died out. It has always found a way to rise back to the surface, kind of like holding a ball a, a beach ball or something, and if you're in the pool and trying to hold that ball underneath the water, eventually your arms and legs are going to get tired. You could even be sitting on it, uh, but eventually you're going to get tired and it's going to slip out, and when it does, it's going to pop up somewhere. And so, this liberal notion of, of more inclusive, more open Christianity 
has always been around and it's always popped back up to the surface. And so that continued uh, through uh, many of the Christian mystics throughout the centuries and then the modern day uh, appeared in the 20th century through folks like uh, Dr. Paul Tillich, uh, liberal Lutheran theologian of the 20th century, and Norman Vincent Peale. Norman Vincent Peale, who it then influenced Robert Schuller, who created one of the world's uh, largest uh, positive Christian Christianity messages with the Hour of Power in the Crystal Cathedral. Even today, um, Divine Science, Religious Science, and Unity are relatively small organizations or small denominations, if you will, um, in terms of religion in the United States. Um, but certainly the ideas have been very popular and have been adopted by others. Um, of course, many people know about Norman Vincent Peale or Robert Schuller. Um, they readily adopted new thought ideas. Norman Vincent Peale was very much influenced by new thought, by Ernest Holmes directly. They knew each other. And he has spoken in our churches. Not only that, but back in 1987, we had, uh, that was the 100th anniversary of Ernest Holmes' birthday. And the editors of the Science of Mind magazine asked for comments from various people that had known Ernest Holmes, one of whom was Norman Vincent Peale. And Norman Vincent Peale's comment was, I learned positive thinking from Ernest Holmes. Norman Vincent Peale was ordained in, in a fundamentalist church. And uh, then when he, when he was installed in the Marble Collegiate Church in uh, New York City, just reformed, uh, he was not uh, satisfied uh, with, with just talking with the regular members every Sunday and uh, who seemed content to come for a traditional service. And one of his friends took him to hear Emmett Fox. And uh, Emmett Fox had a big crowd of people on Sunday morning. And Emmett Fox always talked in practical terms how right thinking and right living can result in positive experiences with a lot of anecdotes and little case histories and stories. And Norman Vincent Peale was impressed by his presentation and adapted that method of teaching. And his ministry began to grow. And uh, then he wrote his book, bestseller book, the first one, The Power of Positive Thinking. And uh, then years later, Bob Schuller, uh, who was also a member of the Dutch Reformed Church, was impressed by Norman Vincent Peale, and they became friends, and Bob Schiller became a, a uh, protege of Norman Vincent Peale, and Peale endorsed him and went to California and spoke for him at his early, early uh, public, public meetings. And uh, I remember hearing that Bob Schiller uh, presented his uh, seminar on, on church leadership uh, and church growth at Unity Headquarters. Uh, to the, the unity ministers who were assembled, and he started uh, started out by informing people there. He said, uh, "I have I have uh, a debt uh, a debt uh, that I owe unity because much of what I do uh, are, is based on unity principles." Um, Norman Vincent Peale told me as I was a chauffeur in 1978 for a full day, that The Power of Positive Thinking, that title was taken from an article by Charles Fillmore. And when Unity wanted their uh, Silent Unity building and their activity center, their two biggest um, building projects in the middle part of the 20th century um, dedicated, they asked Norman Vincent Peale to do it and he uh, spoke about how powerful the influence of unity had been on him and how it had influenced him. A Dutch reformed uh, uh, denomination, very conservative denomination minister and how it, it shifted his consciousness and he didn't try to hide the fact that he was um, profoundly in, in, uh, influenced by unity. There's a, a beautiful and rich connection between um, uh, the AA movement, the Alcoholics Anonymous movement, and uh, New Thought. One of them is Emmett Fox, 
um, whose literature was extremely popular uh, in the early AA movement and still is today. Many people read Emmett Fox uh, through their connections in the AA movement and don't really know about the rest of the New Thought movement, but they certainly know uh, the writings and the works of uh, the Sermon on the Mount and, and many other works of, of Emmett Fox. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous was being written while uh, uh, Dr. Bob and Bill W. were studying Emmett Fox's Sermon on the Mount. And Emmett Fox was probably the best-selling New Thought author in the 20th century and was a divine science minister. But that's the basis from which they wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Even Ernest Holmes uh, saw and looked at an early edition of, of the big book before it was published and gave his thoughts on it. Well, there's a lot in 12-step um, programs about cleaning up the past, about making amends for, um, for wrongdoings. Uh, and clearing out all that negative energy and emotion. And so I have to practice forgiveness. I can't hold on to the old outmoded ways of thinking and behaving and feeling and expect to grow or expand. And so um, another thing uh, that's, that seems to be an overlap between a recovery program and New Thought is the emphasis on a daily spiritual practice. I've been encouraged in both recovery and in New Thought to meditate every day, to pray every day, to, to have some sort of conscious conscious contact with a power greater than myself every single day. Another connection that AA has uh, with uh, the New Thought Movement is through Emma Curtis Hopkins. Emma Curtis Hopkins' ministry was uh, handed over to uh, a woman. Uh, her ministry was uh, uh, called the High Watch and uh, they went out and bought a farm and it was called the High Watch Farm. And it was its purpose of that ministry was to continue the legacy of Emma Curtis Hopkins' work, to keep her writings in, in print and her teachings uh, out there. Bill W. and his friends that were uh, helping launch the AA movement went to this farm on retreat and uh, began to uh, exchange information and literature and sharing of ideas. And eventually the woman who ran uh, that ministry, the High Watch uh, ministry, turned it over to the AA movement and it became the first retreat and recovery center and still to, to this day is uh, operated as a uh, alcoholic uh, uh, recovery and treatment uh, retreat center that you can go to. And uh, so there again, we see the influence of New Thought uh, through Emma Curtis Hopkins uh, and through Emmett Fox influencing the AA movement. When you begin to follow these traces, you begin to see this web that opens up and uh, it's just one door after another, all of these spider web connections and the world really is connected and that which bridges all of it is simply consciousness. see these, these ideas beginning to reveal themselves in, in all sorts of ways, whether it's on PBS and you see Wayne Dyer, or uh, you turn on Sunday morning and you see Joel Olstein in Texas uh, preaching to 40, 30, 30 to 40,000 people. And he's uh, really giving a message that is very New Thought oriented, the positive believing in yourself, picking yourself up uh, with your own consciousness and moving in the world by affirming and believing in what God has called you to and the healing principles, you're beginning to see that everywhere. Joel Osteen is a lot like a unity minister, but he's just waving a Bible around while he says unity things. And then every once in a while, he di diverges off into a little fundamentalism to keep them happy. But essentially, he's giving a very positive unity type message while waving the Bible around, but he knows how to do it. I was just watching Joel Osteen the other day and I mean, one particular talk that he gave, I haven't seen many of his talks, I've seen a, a few, 
But I mean, he could be speaking signs of mind. With a couple of exceptions, he could have been speaking signs of mind. Now that goes across the board for many Christian churches. Many non-Christians watch him because he's very motivational. He's very inspirational. And some aspects of transformational. He, many fundamentalist preachers criticize him because he's not scholarly enough, he's not biblical enough and all that. They're basically just jealous of his success, to be honest with you. He's a great man and never had any particular aspirations to be who he is and to do what he's doing. But now that he's into it, I think he's, he's shifting into the, the, the newer expression of, a, of Christianity. There's a new spirituality and a new Christianity uh, coming on the scene. There's a global shift in religious sensibilities and he's part of that. It's not by coincidence or accident that those connections are happening. Uh, so in the case of Joel Osteen, for example, uh, his father was very good friends uh, of the Unity Movement and, and of a successful Unity minister in Texas, just down the road from him, uh, Howard Caesar. They were friends, they knew each other, and so Joel today very much knows the New Thought literature, and you see the influence of that in, in his teachings. Joel is sort of an example of a larger uh, picture of uh, uh, evangelicals, Pentecostals, uh, word, the Word of Faith movement. And the Word of Faith movement uh, kind of have a, has an interesting secret that, that they don't want the world to know about <laughs> that is related to New Thought history. And that secret is that, that if you ask anybody in the Word of Faith movement, which is, uh, for those who don't know, there's Word of Faith is a large umbrella term, kind of like New Thought. And there's a lot of different versions of Word of Faith. There's Pentecostal, Evangelical, Holy Rollers, Church of God in Christ, many, many others. In general, the Word of Faith movement considers a man by the name of Kenneth Hagin uh, as their spiritual father, the founder uh, of the movement. But it turns out that Kenneth Hagin was uh, plagiarizing a lot of his work from another individual who came before him, uh, several decades before him. That individual was named uh, E.W. Kenyon. E.W. Kenyon was an evangelical, uh, itinerant preacher and author, very powerful speaker. And in his bio, you can read and, and discover that uh, he went to a place in Boston, a liberal arts college uh, called Emerson uh, College, which is still a liberal arts college today. But in that, in that day that uh, E.W. Kenyon went to it, they also taught uh, basic metaphysics. He, um, earlier in the 20th century, wrote criticizing New Thought metaphysics and yet it was obvious he kind of liked what he heard. And in his own books, he put a good dose of that in it and subtly reinterpreted Pentecostalism. E.W. Kenyon really is the, the spiritual influence to Kenneth Hagin, who uh, is by many considered the father of the Word of Faith movement, which is the hands-on healing, uh, the big tent revivals, what you see in the coliseums and arenas around uh, that movement is actually a cousin of the New Thought movement because it all goes back to Quimby. It all goes back to this idea that we have the power within uh, this universal mind to heal physical form. Now what happened was this split. Those who were of the evangelical uh, Christian camp uh, believed that it was the exclusive right of Jesus and of the Bible that gave the power uh, of this kind of this healing power. and. And so the movement developed in the way that it did, through uh, speaking in tongues and, and laying on of hands and, and washing the blood and all of the theological language that goes with that. On this side, with Quimby and to Mary Baker Eddy, then to Emma Curtis Hopkins and so on down the line, those individuals believed that what they had discovered was a universal principle. And because it was universal, it wasn't bound to just the Bible or to just Jesus. It was certainly in Jesus and it was certainly in the Bible, but not exclusively. And so they believed that you could see it everywhere, that you could see it in nature, as Emerson and the Transcendentalists pointed out, and that you could see it in other religions, uh, that you know William James and, and others have talked about the variety of religious experience, that you could see these same principles being expressed in ancient wisdom traditions, in the Greek philosophies, in nature that's all around us, and in the Bible and in Christianity, that it was an inclusive principle. And that idea 
influenced uh, the authors, the writers, and, and the movement builders of, of the New Thought movement. So the two groups went in very different theological directions because of that. But their origin was the same. The number of self-help books that are out there is, is beyond my imagination. In general, there's 1,000 new books published every single week. Stop and pause. That's overwhelming. 1,000 books published every single week. A great majority of those are self-help books. The reality is, is that new thought, the philosophy of new thought, has trickled down and influenced every one of those books. I don't think there's a single exception. These books come out with new names, they come out with new spin-offs, they come out with new packaging, but in reality you can trace it all the way back to the founders of New Thought. They were the original self-helpers at that point. Everything else, we're all descendants and we all need to be grateful for it. I don't think that the self-help industry would be there if it weren't for the New Thought philosophy. They go hand in hand. New Thought is the foundation of the whole self-help movement. Um, with the, most of the notions that we read about in New Thought books or self-help books are really based in the idea that our thoughts and beliefs create our reality. Virtually everywhere you look, you see these ideas emerging. And one of the places that I see them showing up more and more all the time, and I have for years, is in the business arena. Covey's works, for instance, like The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, is very, very affirmatively oriented. Um, may not speak of God and, and the infinite and all of that sort of stuff. We're seeing this everywhere. As a matter of fact, I've been known to say when I talk to business groups that I think that the, the new knowledge, this new emerging spiritual technology, if you want to call it that, the vehicle for that is probably more for disseminating it is probably more through the business world than it is the religious world. Now, the origin of so much of this comes from the churches, the religious world, the spiritual ideas. But the way it's getting disseminated is as much, if not more, through the business world as any through any other vehicle. I do a lot of corporate speaking. I speak, uh, I've spoken for the Million Dollar Roundtable, I've spoken for Fortune 20 companies, the uh, major automakers, and what I love is that I'm able to take new thought concepts and take it out into the business arena. And this is nothing new. You read Stephen Covey, you read John Maxwell, you read Brian Tracy. It's all about basically having faith that what you want can happen and having a clear vision as to what you want. In 2006, I was doing a book series based on Edwin Gaines' book, The Four Spiritual Laws of Prosperity. And one of the things she recommends is that people try and go 21 consecutive days without complaining. People say they want more abundance in their life, they want better health in their life, and yet they spend so much time focusing on what they don't want as evidenced by their complaining. So the idea that I had was to come up with a way to monitor how people were doing on their trek to going 21 consecutive days. And we gave out these purple bracelets for people. And the idea is put it on either wrist and every time you catch yourself complaining, you take it off one wrist and you switch it to the other wrist. And when you do, you're back on day one and you switch it back and forth and back and forth until you go 21 consecutive days without complaining. Well, we handed out 250 bracelets one Sunday, and before the service was over, people were asking for bracelets. They wanted them for their Cub Scout group and for their sports teams and their offices. And all of a sudden, people started calling us wanting bracelets, and we hadn't set up any kind of an infrastructure. And so we established the Complaint Free World as a nonprofit organization. And again, people just kept calling and calling. The local newspaper here, the Kansas City Star, did a story about us, which was picked up by McClatchy News Services, which was carried around by 32 different newspapers in the country. It was then picked up by Stars and Stripes, which took it to the armed forces around the world. The uh, Los Angeles Times flew in and did a story about us. George Lewis from NBC saw the Los Angeles Times story, that he did a story on us on the Today Show for the first time. From that, People Magazine saw us, and they did a full-page story about us. 
And then the Oprah Winfrey Show saw it. And of course, from Oprah Winfrey, then it went out to the world. And in uh, 2010, Oprah Winfrey's magazine, O Magazine, in South Africa distributed one of our complaint-free bracelets with their magazine to everyone in South Africa who subscribed to the magazine. I wrote a book about the concept and it became an international bestseller. In fact, in 2009, it was the biggest selling book in all of China. In 2009, it was the second largest selling book in China in 2010 and continues to stay on the bestseller list in China three years later. It also was a number one bestseller in Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. I got an email from a woman out on the West Coast. She said she wanted to come and see me in Kansas City. She flew here and came to where I was and told me that she and her husband had filed for divorce and that she then read about the complaint free challenge and she decided to give it a try and she simply decided not to complain to him or complain about him. And she flew all the way out here to tell me that it had saved their marriage. They had dropped the divorce proceedings and they had decided that they were going to uh, stay together and she said it was like being on a perpetual honeymoon. A company was combining two of their sales offices into one statewide office and what the managers there decided to do was, rather than trying to get the employees not to complain, the management alone decided to do the 21 challenge. They all got complaint-free bracelets and they began to support one another in their path to become complaint-free. At the end of the year, they had a record year in sales. Simply because management changed, the people all beneath them sensed the new positive environment and that got them more excited and they did better in their jobs. So we were getting close to having the six millionth bracelet and we wanted to give it to someone who had inspired us. And Dr. Maya Angelou's quote, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude had been sort of our unofficial slogan since we began. And so our board decided that we wanted to give the six millionth bracelet to Dr. Maya Angelou. So I started telling people we were gonna give the bracelet to Dr. Maya Angelou. I don't know Maya Angelou. I don't know anybody who knows Maya Angelou. And yet I went around telling everybody that that's what we were going to do. I contacted my literary agent. He knew no one who knew Dr. Angelou. I contacted my publisher at Random House. He said they had tried uh, in vain several times to contact I, Dr. Maya Angelou and couldn't get in touch with her. And yet I just went around and continued to affirm and to tell people we were going to give the six millionth bracelet to Dr. Angelou. One day I mentioned to someone that we were going to give the bracelet to Dr. Maya Angelou and this person happened to say to me, tell her I said hi. And I snapped my head around and said, do you know Maya Angelou? And she said, I used to book her when she was speaking. And she says, I've stayed in contact with the, uh, her, her assistant. So she called her assistant, asked if uh, they would be interested, and I contacted them. And Dr. Angelo was gracious enough to invite her out and allow us to spend the afternoon with her in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, in her home. It was one of those things where we just set an intention and we left the details to God, and it just works. The uh, fact that new thought doesn't require specific religious beliefs enables people to secularize it. And I think uh, um, Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra and others have done that. We know who Oprah's teachers and influences are, and uh, we know who their influences are, influences are. And we find, that, of course, that new thought is at the root of those things. She has a long friendship um, maybe a mentorship with uh, Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou was very much aware of Unity's teachings um, early in her life and um, worked with Oprah um, as they um, researched or studied those books together, uh, particularly in small, small circles at Maya Angelou's home. I'm trying to be a Christian. And trying to be a Christian is like trying to be a Jew or Buddhist or Muslim or Shintoist. I'm always amazed when people walk up to me and say, I'm a Christian. I think, already? You already got it? I'm working at it. Which means that I try to be as kind and fair and generous 
and respectful and courteous to every human being, seeing myself as him, not as his keeper, at her, as her keeper, but really seeing myself. Black, white, Asian, Spanish-speaking, Native American, I try to treat everybody as I want to be treated. And that's no small matter. Oprah is quoted as saying that Discover the Power Within You is one of the most important books in her personal library. Um, and Discover the Power Within You was um, one of Eric Butterworth's early books. It was published in 1968. I know that Oprah has been influenced by New Thought because uh, one of the people that booked us on The Oprah Winfrey Show told me that she used to be Oprah's personal assistant. One of the things her job was to do was to make sure there was a copy of the Daily Word in every room that Oprah would be going into that day so that she could read the Daily Word wherever she was. Uh, Oprah Winfrey is basically bringing into the mainstream this, this what we call new thought, which is actually, in my opinion, very old thought. My friend Eckhart Tolle, uh, who's written this wonderful book, uh, called A New Earth. It's all about letting the awareness of who you are stimulate everything that you do. He puts it like this. He says, don't react against a bad situation. Merge with that situation instead. And the solution will arise from the challenge. Because surrendering yourself doesn't mean giving up. It means acting with responsibility. You take somebody like Oprah, who just by devoting two shows to The Secret, influenced a lot of lives. I say The Secret was a powerful tool. Every time that we showed that movie in this church, the church was packed. Uh, people who were not what you would consider even religious or spiritual seekers showed up to watch the movie. Partly because I think Oprah Winfrey, with her television show, promoted it well. I'm extremely thankful for The Secret. I, I think that it is what brought this kind of reality, this thought, this belief to the masses. I love the movie The Secret. Whether I was in it or not, I would tell everybody to watch it. And why? It introduces people to the law of attraction, which is an aspect of new thought thinking. And the critics who say that it doesn't tell you everything about new thought or about the law of attraction aren't really thinking this through. It's only a movie. It's only an hour and a half long. It's designed to introduce you and do no more than introduce you to the law of attraction. It does it perfectly. What did it do to the planet? It's helped awaken the world. I've been all over the world because of the secret and people are excited. They're being enthused, they're being empowered, all because of a movie and a book that on the basic level just introduces them to an idea. But well, what an idea and what an introduction. And how exciting that it reached people, that it, well, it gave them a new thought, <laughs> you know, that there was more, that maybe they had um, some control in their lives. And I'll tell you personally, I love that that movie came out because my sister Lori, it was, I love that day when she said, you know what, I heard of this movie called The Secret. And you know that you just used your positive, you know, thinking to attract the life that you want. I'm like, oh my God, Lori, that's what I've been trying to tell you for, <laughs> you know, the past few years. It wasn't new for us. We, we, we know the secret, that's how we've been doing all this. The lady that wrote it was new for her, but when it was introduced, it took the world, you know, it took a lot of people. But a lot of people, you know, criticized, you know, Oprah had them on her show. And then people criticized her for having, you know, they got them, made the little comments because the traditional religion is still so strong. But the secret for new thought is that's all it is, the new thought. When The Secret first came out, uh, I had a the paper, I think it was the paper in San Francisco, called me and said, hey, you know, aren't you guys threatened by this? And, aren't, and isn't it going to be very competitive to your teaching? I said, no, thank God. I said, what do you think we're here for? We give birth to these things. You know, we're grateful that anybody will take any part of it and bring it out, and it may help to meet needs at a certain level. If I had to define the law of attraction in one word, I would define it as alignment. And what I mean by that is your thoughts, your beliefs, your actions, 
and your intentions are all in alignment with each other. For example, if you were doing a certain action but didn't believe that, maybe like a certain action at work, let's say, but didn't believe that it was going to get you ahead, of course it's not going to get you ahead. And if you had a belief maybe that you could get ahead but didn't have the alignment of your actions, you're not going to get ahead either. It, it's not even a belief, it's a knowledge inside of you. Because I think there's a difference, you know, knowledge is something that is maybe one level up above belief. We can say we believe anything, but we really don't know. Knowledge is where you know and that it has to become uh, to the point where it's knowledge and you incorporate it and that gets aligned with everything that you've got in, inside yourself uh, for any kind of law of attraction to work. And, I mean, it's, it's actually always working, but working for you. Well, you know, th there's a very strong relationship between the law of attraction and and, and new thought because one of the elements of the new thought tradition is the understanding that we are creative beings that our thought that our ideas is the catalyst so to speak for a creative law that responds to us it's sort of like saying that you know the universe is a place in which um, the, the the presence or the essence of the universe is a place that wants to say yes to us and desires to say yes and and doesn't really filter that and so quantum physics and, and science and other avenues will show us the same truth. I think where um, the secret is only part of the story is that new thought is much broader than just the creative law. Um, Ernest Holmes, and, and he got this from Thomas Troward and, and uh, Emerson, would talk about both the love and the law. And I think that part of what happens is as people step into new thought, the first thing that for many of us kind of hooks us and says, wow, this is really powerful, is beginning to realize that we don't have to be victims in our life and that we can co-create um, and tap into a power that is very, very powerful, in fact, all powerful. But if that's all there was to it, I would not have stayed. And I think many people that would be true for, because I don't think our hearts are just yearning for um, the, uh, creating things in the world or conditions in our lives. Um, witness people who have conditions that many of us would say are really difficult and troubling and yet still in their heart are feeling very fulfilled and know the love that they are and express in, you know, in, in wonderful ways in the world. So there's something else other than just creating conditions. Although standing in the power of knowing that you are co-creative with the divine is a launching pad so that your heart can open, so that other um, expressions and experiences can, can move in. Where I speak Truth is Where I work of World Religions was in Melbourne and Association for Global New Thought brought together all of the different New Thought faiths and as one unified voice we went to Melbourne to say like hey here we are we're one of the faiths <laughs> and the highlight really was when um, as the Agape Choir with Ricky Byers Beckwith we shared the music and because all of the Agape choir members couldn't make it, this choir now was filled with, you know, artists like me, reverends, and spiritual leaders from all these New Thought communities. This is what our choir was made of. And here we sang our most, um, our deepest, most held beliefs, you know, about our oneness. You could just see this audience of a thousand uh, people from diverse faiths feeling the music feeling that oneness, feeling all the things that we talk about. And I feel like the music was able to create the space for all, for what we believe, you know, all these beliefs we have about oneness and, and love and the connection. It happened that night and it happened through music. And it was so moving because all of the reverends around, I could see people were crying, you know, in the audience and also us in the choir. And, you know, to see the, you know, Sikhs stand up and the Buddhists, you know, get their groove on 
and just really surrender themselves to this moment, it was, it was priceless. It was really priceless. You can get a group of people in a room who suddenly are disagreeing about a lot of things. Ask them to sing a song together, and suddenly you've unified that group. It's like the thread that can pull us back together. I often think that music is one of the most powerful ways we have to pull all of us together, no matter what we believe, where we are, or what corner of the world we live in. And so music for new thought to me is very exciting because it again, focuses more on what unifies all of us. It's not that hard to sing about peace or love or joy or beauty. And when you sing, when you hear that, when you see a performer or someone doing that, or you yourself are joined in with them, you can't help but feel lifted up. People will listen to you know, a message of a song before they'll go into a church and listen to a sermon. So I think the music of New Thought, the more that we connect that kind of philosophy, the philosophy of openness and oneness and unity and equality for all and the cultural creatives, the Oprah crowd, whatever you want to call them, as long as they, if we find out they have a kind of music you know, that supports that lifestyle and belief system, uh, it'll, it's, it's definitely helping. You know, music has helped in the past many movements grow. I think that the power of music is very profound and I think that it transcends so many boundaries. I think it is very vital and important and my vision is that we would be able to move outside of the communities that are necessarily new thought. Words have power, period. The, the words that we speak carry an energy, an essence, a potency about them. And so it stands to reason that the words that we sing and songs also carry an energy and a potency about them. When we become conscious of that, when we become uh, great stewards of our words, then there's a, there's a beautiful uh, sacredness about an individual who begins to devote their musical talents towards uh, the, the sacredness of those words and uh, begins to uh, write and compose things that are more affirmative rather than from a place of victimization. And, um, and that's, there's, there's great healing in that, not just for the person singing the song, but for the person who's listening to the song. Silent Unity is a 24-7 prayer service at Unity Village, which is located outside of Kansas City, uh, Missouri. You can call in and ask for prayer, and the person who takes your call will pray with you on the phone for whatever your prayer request is, and then they'll... Um, and then your prayer request is held in the Silent Entity Prayer Vigil Chapel for 30 days. And someone is always praying there. And they've been praying there for 125 years or so. And as part of my um, job responsibilities at Silent Entity, not only did I take calls with people who called for prayer, but during my shift, I spent 30 minutes in the prayer vigil chapel. And usually I was in there with one or two other people. And there was one day where someone couldn't make their shift and I was the only person in the prayer vigil chapel. And going into that space is like going into the heart of the mother. It is one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. It's so peaceful and so quiet and the presence of God is palpable there. And during the time that I was the person, I was holding this high watch, this prayer vigil uh, that had been going on for so many years. I just felt like I was the point of power for a moment. And just the intensity and the immensity of Everyone that had called for prayer, all the people who had ever prayed, the, just the power of that prayer energy was, so, I felt like such a vessel for spirit in that moment. In New Thought Prayer, we, we often call it affirmative prayer. And uh, in Center for Spiritual Living, it's, called, it's usually called spiritual mind treatment. So the idea of affirmative prayer is that it, we don't consider God a capricious God that's going to say, well, I feel like giving you what you want today and 
maybe not tomorrow, or I, I want to give this person what they want, not this person. We, we acknowledge that God is love all the time. And as it says in the Bible, asking shall receive. It's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So when we pray affirmative prayer, it's actually affirming that what we desire is already present. It's already in the mind of God. It's already in us in potential. So if, if there's a healing or a physical healing, a, a healing of a relationship, a material prosperity, guidance, anything, we acknowledge that it's already ours. We pray affirming the truth. I affirm that my life is good. I don't ask it to be good. I affirm that it is good. So instead of saying, God, uh, please give us a beautiful day, I would say, God, thank you for giving us a beautiful day. Thank you for the blessings that we have. Thank you for the blessings that we are going to receive. And so everything is positive and stated as though it already were. Prayer to me is a communion with God. Uh, I go, I don't always go to God begging. I go to him for the pleasure of being with him. Uh, I open myself for him to speak to me and to say things to me and tell me and answer questions for me and tell me what to do next because a lot of days I don't know what to do next. And I'm not too proud to say, Father, I don't know what to do, but if you tell me what to do, that's exactly what I will do. And, and so it's not just to go and get something from him. We're back to, I'm made in his image likeness. So uh, I can handle a lot of things. You see, because I have this Christ inside of me, and 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 I'm capable, and not this has nothing to do with ego, although I have some ego, but this is not based on ego. This is based on the fact that I accept the reality that I am made in the image likeness of God, and all the the strength, the understanding, the peace, the joy, the love, all those things that are are pieces of God are in me, and they are pieces of me also. Your prayer should be always first a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of being a witness to the fact that you're praying as if it's already done. Jesus taught us that. He said, act as if it's already done. And we say, if not this, then something better. It's it's kind of the idea that we're not we're not treating the condition, we're not we're not trying to change God's mind or talk God into doing something for us. We're actually praying to change our consciousness into this of acceptance and belief and faith. And that's what causes the manifestation to happen. Yeah, I think it, it has been proven scientifically that thoughts are things. I mean, we've been hearing that since really, from some people since we were children, how the power of a thought, but really they've done medical testing and hooked people up to electrodes and, and it shows the patterns of what goes on in the physical when we think good thoughts. Every mental event will trigger a neurological response will, which will trigger a physical response. As I think, so I am. What I expect, I experience. What I'm feeling is creating something. That every single thought is an act of creation. And when I couple feeling with it, then I can be certain sure that what I'm creating is going to come through and come through indeed. Well, that's what a new thought is about. You, you think something different than what you have always thought. Whatever you're holding in consciousness, whatever you think about, that's what you're going to get in your life. If you can understand, know thyself, which is something philosophy and religion say, um, you discover the power of positive thinking. You'll be going towards good health, um, mental health, intellectual health, as I call it, and physical health. I mean, all go together. I mean, you can't have physical health if you're having bad thoughts all the time. Um, it's all integrated. It's knowing that regardless of what the doctor says, you are a spiritual being, and that spiritual part of you, that when you connect with that, you could have a miraculous healing. If you read, you know that the doctors, the medical professional has said, the people who come with faith are the best patients in the world because they hold on to something that grips them to get them through an experience. Doctors have said that. Research has shown it, that people have a, a religious faith, they always make better patients. I think any physician realizes that when you have two patients, 
um, with the same illness, uh, they see the same physician, they get the same treatment, uh, they can have completely different outcomes. Your body is not just a physical machine. If a doctor thinks a body is a physical machine, then he becomes or she becomes a superb technologist, a superb technician who knows everything about the human body but a lousy healer because healing is wholeness. You know the word healing, holy, wholeness comes health. It all means the same thing. It means looking at yourself as an integrated whole. I had an aneurysm to rupture in my brain while I was doing the Johnny Carson show. For two days, I didn't use anything because I was unconscious. But um, it is what I knew, the knowledge that I had because that kept me alive. And let me say this, I had marvelous attention. I had wonderful doctors, I, nurses. Uh, my family was uh, of a healing nature for me. I had all of the uh, uh, things that I needed from the human side. Uh, but when a man, when the doctor would come to my room every day and explain to me uh, why I had to die, uh, I would have to uh, re resort to the God inside of me. And I have to remember that my God is a healer. I would have to remember, I don't have to die because you say so. You ain't got nothing to do with how long I live. This is between God and I. And I had something to fall back on because of the training I had had. But it was the Christ inside me that healed me and made it possible because um, from what they said, I was, was supposed to be dead before I hit the floor. You see, uh, that was their opinion. And, and they had studied, uh, the doctors had studied many years uh, uh, to tell me that. And I had to just not believe any of their study points uh, or uh, any of their any of that. I had to believe that God had things for me to do and he was a healer and he would bring me through. And he did. If there's a need or a challenge or uh, something critical in your life, you can get a new idea about that. Now that's what the kingdom of God is within you, the goodness of God. A new positive idea, one of healing, one of peace, one of illumination, one of prosperity, one of order, one of harmony. There is a spiritual counterpart within you that you can call upon to help address this need in your life. Now that's pretty much part of the heart of new thought. I personally believe you can be a member of any religion or any philosophy and still use new thought. Because new thought in many ways is a psychology. It's a metaphysics of thinking. It's about thinking in a positive way. It's about controlling your thoughts. It's about having goals and visions and using the power of belief. I can't think of a single religion that would be against that. So new thought can be within any belief system that you might already have and probably empower it and multiply the power within it without changing or violating or doing anything that's against the religion. What's amazing about new thought is that it doesn't just say like, um, okay, here's the box and this is what we believe God is. No, you know what? It off It's a hand like this. It offers, there's an open space. It just says here, here's an open space of, of, of maybe um, what the divine could look like for you, an expanded version. That's the difference in new thought. We're giving you a how-to and that's the key. Well, I like the uh, usefulness of it. It's... Uh, it certainly speaks to mystical concepts, of course, but by the same token, it's, it's incredibly practical. It's a positive message, and that it brings uh, the, the idea that we really can create a better life to us. And that is a basic element of what we teach in, in our uh, New Thought world. Knowing these principles, I have to say, have improved my life dramatically. The difference is that there are so many classes there is just this wealth of great teachers and spiritual practices that really integrate into a life in such a way that you can really begin to experience peace and wholeness. 
and that's what's really made such a huge difference for me. There's an incredible power that happens, a transformative power that happens when you really begin to understand the creative process. When you drop that attitude of um, helplessness, the concept of being a victim or you know being a ship on this uh, giant sea where all these other forces outside of you are influencing you. And um, on the other side of all that information and all the laws and all the studying and all the everything else is, it, it, it is transformation. The only solution to a problem is not to look at the problem or not even to look at for a solution but to expand the awareness. It's like, you know, you're looking out of your room outside and you have a small window. That's all you're going to see, what the window allows you to see. So when I'm in a state of challenge by life, uh, I get to remember that God is the source and substance of all of my supply. And if I believe that I am one with this God power, that life force is in me and can guide me and direct me and inspire me to the next level of understanding. And what we know is, is that we cannot solve one challenge with the mindset that it was created in. So in other words, we have to change our mind to be able to find a solution to any challenge that we have in our life. And so as we grow in consciousness, things that were not possible before become possible. And this is what New Thought teaches you, is to grow in consciousness every day, because everything is possible in another consciousness than the one you had. In New Thought, we recognize the fact that spirituality is not something that's done and then you're finished. You don't just accept Jesus and it's all over. We awaken to a new beginning in each and every moment. Every day is an opportunity to be reborn in Christ. You know, Jesus talked about loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Neighbor really comes from the English two words, nearby. Love your nearbys <laughs> or your neighbors as you love yourself, meaning love your soul, as you love your essence. And as you really loving really means to reclaim and regain your, your soul. Your suke is the word soul in Greek. Your psychology, your thought life. Because thoughts are powerful, they're creative, they're inventive. And so when we recover the soul or renew and renew the mind, <laughs> then we've transcended the limitations of human consciousness and extended into spiritual awareness. Nothing's more free, nothing's more powerful. There's no animosity, there's no hostility, there's no competition in that. We don't compete, we just complete each other. Christ and Jesus is two different things to us. Christ is God in you. We, we see God as everywhere equally present, but when we talk about God as it expresses through people, that is the Christ. Christ is nobody. Christ is not Jesus' last name. I don't personally believe that, that God is a physical being someplace. I believe that God is energy and God is a force that is present in all of us at all times. That God is the creator of everything and everybody. Uh, so, but you have to you have to you have to know that for yourself and, and all the experiences that you have I think are just leading you to a deeper understanding of God and then and, and, and that I am that 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 one force that exists in all of us there's one presence and one power God the good omnipotent all right that's heaven. One presence, one power, God the good, omnipotent. Now then, we can take and use as we do, that's the only way we can exist, is use draw, your drawing on that power and using it. We can create our hell. You see, on that electric plug in the wall, it's a good power. But I stick my fingers in it and it's not too good. 
Okay, I think it's the same thing with the use of the one presence and one power, because we're free will beings, and we can create our hell. We can create our own messes. We can also create our answers. We can also create uh, the solution. I would say in, in New Thought, and the take on the, the teachings would be, there's a lot of people who show up on Sunday mornings in our churches and they're still looking for the, the, the whole commentary on people going to hell. And in reality, hell is a place of negativity. It can be, you know, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is found within. So I always chuckle to myself and say, so is the kingdom of hell. It has to do with our mindset. And, you know, thoughts held in mind reproduce after their kind. So if we are constantly focusing on lack and what isn't working, we create hell. But when we focus on the good in life, when we focus on what it is we want to see made manifest, we create heaven. It's a mindset. When I was brought up, I was brought up Catholic, and they did tell you that it was geographical. And they put the fear of God in you and the fear of the devil in you. It wasn't pleasant, and it took me most of my life to get over it. Thank goodness for new thought, which taught me that your thinking is creating your heaven or your hell. When I became aware of that and started to go with creating my thoughts in a more heavenly way, oh, life became so much more peaceful and happy and serene and wonderful. And I realized, again, that it's your thoughts that create heaven or hell. They are not places. They are spaces of mentality. So you can experience and express your divinity in heaven here on this planet or in earth and in this dimension, or you can express and experience hell. I like to say it like this. What if there were no right and wrongs, good and evil, just choices and decisions with consequences, a consequence or sequel. A sequel is that which follows. You make a choice, you make a decision from anywhere from eating to thinking to speaking. You make a decision or a choice. There is a sequence to it or a sequel to it. I don't care what you're going through, keep going. When you're going through hell, don't stop to take pictures. <laughs> Just keep moving, man. Keep believing in you. Keep believing in the God in you, in the great I am. I am that I am that I am. That's enough. The biggest criticism I've ever heard about new thought is the same criticism I, I hear about any philosophy that has hope in it. And that is, it leads to a state of magical thinking. And the people that are really skeptical out there think that we're doing a disservice when we tell people to, to believe in magic or possibilities or even miracles. I don't agree at all. I think that this, what they're calling magical thinking, is empowered thinking. It's the difference between looking at a glass and seeing it half full or half empty. Which is it really? If a scientist goes and measures the glass and then looks at it, he might say there's three inches of water in it and it's a six inch glass. But it's up to you to decide is it good or is it bad. The skeptics want you to look at reality, and reality we can put in quotes, and they want you to think that it's bad. They want you to be aware that it's bad. I look at the same thing and go, wait a minute, I think it's actually good. I can stay lubricated, I can stay hydrated, I can make a difference with this, I can probably cook something with this and feed myself. So there's wonderful reasons to look at the positive. I think that new thought is empowering us to be able to transcend reality into a divine degree where we create magic and miracles. When we look at this reality and we don't see the potential there, then we're more or less victims. We play with what we see in front of us, we react to what we see in front of us, we don't respond and we don't create. So I don't believe that the criticism about New Thought being magical thinking is actually valid. I think that it's practical thinking on a higher level. You know, people when they talk about the Buddha, they always talk about the tree of enlightenment and I wonder if anyone has ever wondered why he got enlightened under a tree. Um, because when he saw that tree, he also, in a moment of insight, saw rainbows and sunshine and earth and water and wind and air and the infinite void and the whole history of the universe in that tree. But he also saw birds and he saw worms and he saw roots going deep into the earth and he saw the ecosystem of the forest in that tree. He recognized that the tree was the whole universe pretending to be a tree. And 
that was the expansion of his consciousness, the enlightenment that we call Buddha's enlightenment or awakening, that he saw nothing exists by itself. That in fact every every incident, every molecule, every atom, every biological organism, every tree, every flower is a conspiracy of the total universe since the beginning of time. And that was, as I said, Buddha's enlightenment, but we come with that potential, all of us. I think I think the great cosmic joke that God played on all of us. <laughs> to really confuse them, I'm going to make them all different <laughs> and see if they can ever figure it out. But it's not what's on the outside, it's what's inside. Joy, my wife, is Japanese. She doesn't have a Japanese heart, she doesn't have a Japanese brain. All that stuff is internal. And we all have a brain that functions the same way. We all have a heart that functions the same way. And you have to work until you internalize these messages wherever you get them from. It doesn't matter, it's all the same ideas. And they mean nothing until you use them. Then they mean everything. What does the future of New Thought look like? That's the question that we have to answer. I believe that, the, for me, the future of, of New Thought as I see it uh, is beginning uh, to own our Christian roots without excluding our universal acceptance of everybody's path. That those two things ex uh, coexist and commingle together in a really beautiful, wonderful way. That our centers are indeed centers more than they are churches. They're open and inclusive to everyone. And that begins to really embody the Jesus message, the Christ message, that reached across the aisle and, and brought everybody to the table. And with that, that which we teach in New Thought, which is the only thing that you cannot have, is that which you cannot demonstrate. And so as we begin to demonstrate oneness, as we begin to demonstrate uh, inclusivity, as we begin to demonstrate that there's only one power and one presence and one life in this world, if that power and that presence is moving through you and it's moving through me, as we begin to demonstrate that, it must, as we begin to embody that, it must have a demonstration, it must have an outpicturing in the world. And I believe that outpicturing is going to reveal itself through social justice, through community service, through really serving the world uh, to help create uh, a world that works for everyone, help make the world a better place, uh, to embody our message of being a group of people who can stand for something and against nothing. And with that, uh, I think we'll participate in the healing of world conditions through our service and through our action and through our teaching and our consciousness.
Thank you.